Welcome to the Blooming League of Original Podcast. G'day and welcome to the 50th edition of Thrash and Treasure, the Torture Chamber musical comedy podcast where the bravest individuals from Broadway, Hollywood and beyond help us to dissect the artist's own work. Awkward. And speaking of beyond help, I'm Aaron, and I'm joined as usual by my co-host and sidekick. His music tastes go from Van Cartier to Cardi B, but his bread tastes like Cardi board. Oh. It's Captain Evan of the 45th Metal Squadron. How you doing? <laughs> hey, how you going? Yeah, good, thanks. Now, uh, did you hear about this Twitter blue quickly? Uh, uh, only vaguely for like 30 seconds. I'm like, what's that? Oh, I don't well, have yeah, time. What is that? What the hell, Twitter? And I think they've called it Twitter blue because it's dead in the water already. I think, as usual, they're going to make us pay for features we should already have. That's yeah. what it is, which we've been asking for for years. But anyways, guess what? What? School's out for summer. So we have another legendary diva in the classroom today. And with this man here, it's now the Rock and Roll High School. So pay attention, kiddies, because this lyrical lecturer is going to carry us to the top of Mount Rock since grinding his metal teeth as a lyricist for Disney's country rock musical film, Home on the Range, left him entangled with our overlords to later have his whimsical words wind up in the mega hit glam rock hair metal movie Tangled, plus its subsequent TV series, earning him a Golden Globe and Oscar nominations, plus two Emmy wins and two Grammy wins, not to mention numerous additional accolades. It's easy to see why he's the maestro of metal doorstoppers. But illustrious tchotchkes aside, this artist's gra 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 credentials saw him re-team with famed headbanger Alan Menken to find their feet and voices for the splash hit thrash opera The Little Mermaid, which luckily left them voiceless and legless, ready to jump blindfolded into two Catholic musical adaptations, a true leap of faith that led to the second-to-none electro-goth hit Sister Act, which lent us the gift of gallivanting through gallivant and galvanizing the TV grunge landscape. So please give the warmest, most Aussiest g'day and devil horns to the lyricist who is dearest to our hearts, whose treasured verses helped Christine die and sing once more in the death metal sequel, Love Never Dies, before matriculating for a second time with Andrew Lloyd Webber at today's chosen rock school sequel, So please welcome to the torture chamber called Slaughter Race, the librettist whose raunchy rhymes put the saucy in sausage party. But today he snagged his sausage on our grill. Oh, great. Now I've just made things weird. But that's all right. He's here to help us see the darkness because it's the multi-award winning Mr. Glenn Slater. How are you going? Welcome to the torture chamber. Did I get all that right? You got it all right. I Except for the snagging the sausage on the grill part. That that was very wrong. But other than that, all good. <laughs> very wrong. When I wrote that, <laughs> I died. Let's just say, again, that's another instance. That, do I dare say that to such a legendary guest? And this is Thresh and Treasure. So, yes, I did. I did say that. But, yes, anyways, how are you going? Uh, doing okay. Doing okay. Yeah. So now, I have to ask, because you are a Harvard graduate, do you call yourself a librettist when you're around your fancy Harvard mates? I do not, because we separate libretto, from, which is the book, the script, from the lyrics. And I, and I mostly just do the lyrics. So. Oh, okay. Oh, now I look like an asshole. <laughs> yes, I'm pedantic to the end. I've done libretto on, on occasion, but mostly lyrics. Yeah, awesome. Now, is it true that you wrote songs for Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey, or is it Barnum and Bailey and Ringling Brothers? It's Ringling Brothers and Barnum okay. and Bailey, and I, I did indeed. You did? Oh, wow. Yeah, Ringling Brothers is, you know, well, it was, it no longer exists, but it was for over 100 years, the big traveling circus mm-hmm. in America with elephants and tigers and lions and, you know, three rings of everything. And I wrote songs for them for seven years, for a long time. Oh, wow. Yeah. I do remember seeing one of them i think it was maybe 1990 that would have been before my time with them i wasn't until the late 90s but uh yeah i mean it's uh, an american tradition which sadly no longer exists yeah but. and i know that like the whole animal things yes but yeah. speaking of clowns we'll move on to metal <laughs> and i know you had said to me in the dm that you don't know much about metal mm-hmm. so have you had any experience in your youth 
head banging? You know, I, I haven't had much experience with metal at all. I was, I did get my start in a rock band and, you know, I'm pretty conversant with almost every genre except for metal. I <laughs> definitely listen to like proto metal, like Led Zeppelin, I guess, or I, I guess what we would call like hair metal back in the eighties, but definitely not any of the heavier forms of the genre. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty new to it. Yeah. Now, uh, for those people at home, I'd actually sent you an album that Evan has been dying to do Primus Pork Soda for a couple of months now. And nearly every guest, he suggests it and the guest overrides it. In the end, all the theme <laughs> overrides it, the poor guy. Yeah. And then I sent it to you and you said, oh, I was expecting something harder. Mm -hmm. And so like a true carny, I uh, turned up the notches and got Evan to give to us Devil Driver, Pray For Me, oh, Pray For Villains. Pray For Villains. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So before Evan goes on his tangent, I'm going to quickly run through my review. When I first saw the cover, I was like, pray for villains. No way. Pray for me. Oh, should I just ruin that joke? Then I proceeded to use my mouse to click on the little sideways triangle, which gave permission for this band to begin defiling my speakers with their epically melodramatic drums. And I could make 101 gra 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 jokes, but I'd just be beating a dead horse which is subsequently what that sounds like. When the grass ceased to gra and the soaring clean vocals took over, it invoked the feeling of running, then jumping off a cliff and soaring. But since humans can't fly through the air with the greatest of ease, the gra 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 also becomes the sound of hitting rocks on your way down. <laughs> Even if fate stepped in, you'd be dead. Not like this lively drumming, which is as unrelenting as a power bottom on Twitter. Shout out to... Anyways, let's move on. <laughs> Yet again, metal musicians cannot count, as forgiveness is a sixth gun, but alas, was the seventh track. It's clear to me that my OCD and metal albums are at war, much like the machine gun drumming, which hurt my arms just listening to the speed. They say a devil driver is a bell used to ward off witches, which is maybe why I couldn't get too close to this album, especially since, lyrically, every time I heard the words, this is your conscience speaking, I'd end up getting lost in a conversation with my own Jiminy Cricket. So, I'm stumped. Take out the gra gra gra, and you have an album overpowered by the drumming, which didn't seem to have much variety. Without many peaks and valleys, only rolling runs and cliff dives, for those of us who have wings, Surprisingly, though, unlike other thrush death metal albums, it didn't really grate on my tits. There just wasn't any trapeze to latch onto every time those soaring vocals took over. Two stars? <laughs> I don't know. This was yeah. so odd. You're left with a bad taste in your mouth. No, I'm. that's the thing. I'm, and you're not sure what it is. I'm not. I'm not left with a bad taste. I just think, as I say, there wasn't enough for me to latch onto. But what there was there was almost enough. It was like bubbling under 100 <laughs> on the, the, the charts, <laughs> you know? That's that's how it felt like to me. It, it was unrelenting, yes. Um, and there was those moments where the, those clean vocals were just sore. You'd just be like, dun, 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 dun. Ooh, like that. And <laughs> those moments were cool because they, they gave you something to, to latch on to as someone who is quite surprisingly, after 50 episodes, still immune to gra 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 so I, I'm not sure. Evan, why did you pick this one? What was your motivation here? Were you trying to scare me away with the title? Well, because we needed to go, you know, heavier than um, heavier than Primus. And so I did. And then you're like, no, 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 I want to choose something else. So I, this is literally the third choice. <laughs> You make me sound <laughs> difficult. No, I mean, I've, I, I know, I'm not, a, I wouldn't call myself a Devil Driver fan from way back or anything, but I certainly, I knew of them, would be able to sort of recognize them, you know, on the radio if they ever got played. But yeah, they've just been around, well, they've been around, they were formed in 2002. Oh God, how many albums total? Well, this is their fourth album in 2009. Yeah, I ended up listening, I, I listened to this and then went, I, I need to hear everything. So I've, I actually spent a lot of time listening this week. I've listened to School of Rock, obviously, I think about three times. And I went and listened to their entire back catalogue um, from the start to the, to the latest. And they put out a new album in 2020, which is just epic. But the first albums uh, like sound a little like Corn. There's, there's a bit of rap in there. Funnily enough, this one is more experimental than the others. Like there's a lot more different genres going on in, within metal, obviously. You know, it's not like there's 
ballads and stuff but like you know the new albums are although awesome yeah all the songs are very much the same and you know like I said early on they they sounded a little bit, little bit like corn and lots of different influences and they sort of took them a few albums to really find their what they sounded like and yeah as you said the term devil driver refers to bells that uh, drive away witches and yeah italian witches yeah yeah no i i love this i love this so much i agree with the drums there are times there where he kind of overplays a bit and i will accuse the drummer of overplaying yeah he does yeah drown everyone else out occasionally if you could get arrested for abusing a kick drum oh my god yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah although i mean he is amazing and amazingly fast and very impressive sometimes he does need to sort of sit back a bit i'll give you that one yeah i, d- I deliberately didn't look up his arms just to see how thick they would be I, I stayed away from that this week but yeah like i said it's the cross genre album just the experimentation like there's a really cool key change in fate stepped in back with a vengeance was more old school rock influences you know you could nearly hear acdc in there i ha- i wasn't actually a huge fan of track five um i've been sober but even when you're not a fan of the vocals the guitarist saves it every time yeah the middle of the album sort of meandered a bit and then track eight came back with uh, waiting for november which is just awesome and then another favorite was track 10 another night in london i am in love with the guitarist i am leaving my wife and one day we're getting married and we're going to have a midnight wedding on Halloween with a demon celebrant and a little demon imp groomsman with Randy Rhodes playing wedding waltz. I'm marrying this guitarist. Don't you dare marry. You're straight. <laughs> Don't you dare marry a guy before oh. I get to. How dare I, you? I, You've been married before. Twice. <laughs> Twice. Well, it's going to be three times. Bloody straights. If, if he accepts my proposal, this they, I mean, that guy is just incredible. The guitarist is amazing. Um, he's, he's the only one who actually went to music school and he does all the programming and all the um all the software side of it and you know he's the ocd tech nerd and you can kind of hear it in his playing he's just so freaking brilliant um it's annoying sometimes when the like the songs will fade out and he's still going he's like oh i don't want to stop playing stop fading me out you know i want to go for 10 minutes i just get the impression like he will just keep playing if you let him yeah lisa simpson <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. Now, Glenn, what did you think of this? Did this satisfy your request? You know, I think I, I'm coming out sort of in the same place you guys did. I approached it very open-mindedly. The title Pray for Villains was very intriguing. Yes. You know, coming from a Disney background where the villains are like the best part of the show. Yes. And they're on my t-shirt right now, including mm-hmm. Ursula, <laughs> which I oh know is from an animated one, but still. So I'm gonna Yeah, I was, you know, I was definitely looking forward to uh, you know, some anti-hero worship and some good meaty dramatic stuff and you know the first track did not disappoint definitely dove right into that kind of subject matter and it was suitably bludgeoning and like like you guys i mean astonished at the speed of the drumming astonished at the assault of the guitars i agree with you evan like the guitarists are fantastic and throughout just the interplay between the two guitars is always there's always really interesting textures going on You know, even when the main thrust of it is just sort of full on aggression, you are getting sort of some interesting stuff going on between the guitars. Mm. But I did kind of feel like 13, 14 tracks in, however deep it goes, it got got very steamy. And I was like clinging to everything that felt a little bit fresh, you know, on on a track three, Fate Stepped In. You know, it starts off with almost like a rockabilly kind of a riff. And I was like, okay, well, this is, this is something new. And then it sort of settled back into that same sort of bludgeoning approach. And, you know, I agree, like Waiting for November starts off great. Same thing with track 10. Also, like you get this really interesting chiming guitar and it feels like it's going in a slightly different direction. And then about a minute in, it settles back into the bludgeon. So, yeah, I mean, I could see them sort of stretching for other stuff and then always sort of coming back to, to their main approach. It's not helped for me by the vocalist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, all I kept thinking was like, it sounds like Cookie Monster is having a stroke. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's, um, I mean, it's almost unintentionally comic. Like, again, it's, I hear where he's going and there's like a, you start with this sort of demonic possession sort of feel. And then it, it just becomes so much of it that it stops being evocative and starts being sort of funny almost yeah it's like when you you drink coca-cola and it goes down the wrong hole and you try to breathe in and it gives you that demonic 
like uh-huh. that. That's uh-huh. what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, that's that's a perfect analogy. That, that, although that is actually a thing, a reverse scream. Uh-huh. Yeah. Be able to scream yeah. while inhaling. Yeah. I know. I live in this house, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But way back when, when we were playing in a cover band, the, the singer was practicing it. I remember him trying to do it and it's, yeah, not easy. No. That's why I used that analogy that jump off a cliff and I couldn't quite grab a trapeze because there wasn't enough there to latch onto or the bar was slippery. That bar kept swinging back to what they know instead of letting us in on it. Yeah. To Glenn's point, I chose this because it is more, they're more diverse album. You know, it's not that (laughs) samey. Like I said, I listened to the entire catalogue from start to finish and there is a lot of the same stuff and you can't really tell album to album too much. That, that there's been a change. Um, even with their lineup changes, it's it's very hard to tell that that's a, that anyone has changed. Um, but yeah, a, a, apart from the big sort of decade gap of, of the early albums sounding a little like Corn, but the new albums, yeah, the last couple, all the songs do sound pretty much the same. But if you love that kind of thing, you just go, yeah, more of this. So, you know, there's there are fans who love it and don't want them to change. So, yeah, and they do have a huge following. These guys are, you know, they sell out. They they fill stadiums, even if you've never heard of them. You know, no, I haven't. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine live, it must be just sort of awe-inspiring. Yeah. That amount of noise and energy is, you know, it's like a like a tornado almost. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Especially when, when the clean vocals take over. I can imagine mm-hmm. that's very stadium, sing along to those bits. Yeah, no, it's I, so I, sort of successful. I don't know if this is their most versatile album, then that doesn't. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I know. It doesn't make me want to push it up (laughs) to a two and a half, is what I'm saying. If you had said that they get more experimental and do find peaks and valleys in their their music, this is about as experimental as they get. That's (laughs) why it's there. Yeah. But no, yeah, like I said, I loved it. I've listened to it at least three times in a row and, and then. And then went listen to all their other albums as well. Yeah, thoroughly enjoying myself. Yeah. So what would you give it out of five, Glenn? And would you listen to it again? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I don't know if I would listen to it straight through as an album again. Yeah. I could see like a track sort of sprinkled among some other stuff to sort of provide a big jolt of energy. Yep. And then, you know, to go back to something else. I, as an album, I would, I would probably be, be with you on that too. You know, it definitely, the musicianship lifts it above a one mm-hmm. because it's, there was some interesting stuff there just from a pure playing standpoint. Yeah. But yeah, it was a, it was a tough listen straight through. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. I think that's the idea. Yeah. Yes. And for some reason lately, Spotify, I know Evan and I were bitching mm. and about it, has on Spotify web, if you listen to an album, if you don't put it on repeat, it'll just start playing other music from other bands. So I was literally sitting here for two and a half hours knowing this album wasn't on repeat, thinking it's never going to bloody end. I'm <laughs> never going to get out of this. Help me. What has he done to me? I'm going to have to give him bloody Les Mis. <laughs> or something like really long, like Lord of the Rings, the musical or something, yep. just as revenge. And it turns out it was playing Bloody Lamb of God. Yep. And I'm, yep. I'm paying for this. This is not the option I chose. Thank you very much, Spotify. You're not paying your artists correctly. You don't label your artists correctly. So at least let us have our settings correctly, please. Thank you. Sorry. That's me losing my mind. Yep. I, uh, yeah, I had the same problem. I, I went into the settings, you uncheck yep. autoplay, yep. and then I've listened through to School of Rock and it starts playing Phantom of the Opera at the end of it. Oh, wow. Oh, no, that's not fair. It ruined it for you. you I know. And I'm like, hey, I can't listen to this. We haven't done this one oh, yet. No, no, you can't. And, and we can't do the sequel yet, which we will get to because... I actually saw it in Melbourne. Ooh. Yeah, that's probably as metal as I get, that show. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I think our prayers have not been answered this week. But while we're on Love Never Dies, now, fun fact, as we established before, you did some work for Joss Whedon early on in your career that you obviously never met him and, and all that jazz. And so did I, and I never met him either. But we still get to claim that's mm-hmm. early on our resumes. But we're actually one degree away from each other acting wise because your Christine Daae was Anna O'Byrne who was my Little Mermaid when I did the Little Mermaid in 1999. Wow. A terrible, terrible pantomime version Uh which the director was a fucking psychopath. Aren't they all? (laughs) (laughs) 
but her father was in it, her sister was in it, uh -huh. and their mum was the rehearsal pianist. Wow. And I was seaweed, Glenn. <laughs> Yeah. So she yeah. then obviously went to play Christine Daae and I am dying inside slowly. Yeah. When you're, when you're cast as inanimate plant matter and your co-star goes on to be a megastar, it can be definitely an ego crushing experience. <laughs> That's fine. Remember, I do have Joss Whedon on my resume <laughs> early in my career, which we're going to throw to a quick ad break now that I've bragged about myself for a minute in front of a Disney icon and a Broadway Hollywood legend. So we're back in a moment with Russian Treasure. This summer, winter, spring, or fall, the first ever musical theater sitcom where you go behind the scenes of the latest West End show, The Fosse Forest Ballet. Where's the important stuff? Aha! A thousand pound a week ensemble rate. Ah, that's what Mamma Mia likes. Starring Philip Joel and a West End cast featuring Carrie Ellis, Dara Day, Louise Demon, and Oliver Savile, and more. It all started in 1987 when I was a jobbing actress working in a diner. Yeah, it's just I, I had a really bad experience when I was touring Australia with a wombat. <gasps> Darling! Mwah, 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 mwah. How long have I been mentoring you? Three months? Two years. So her name is Henrietta. The horse. Yes. I've managed to secure you an audition for the biggest, most innovative, and the latest show to be going into the West End. Joseph and his Technicolor dream card. Think more along the lines of Pant. Frozen. You can watch this episode for the price of a coffee. Simply go to www.thefussyforestbelly.com. Any and all profits go back to theatre charities, acting for others, and the theatre's trust. You'll laugh, you'll cry, and you'll see a grown man in sparkly tights. Tight nights. Nice. Tight. <laughs> Alrighty, it's Thrush and Treasure. I'm Aaron, that's Evan, and we are joined by the one and only Glenn Slater. Goodness gracious me, another Disney lyricist on my show. What the hell is life? <laughs> like, we all know what the past two years have been like. This has just been such a whirlwind for us all. And then get to have my idols on the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, I know we went we went Christmas shopping yesterday and there was actually a Disney princess stand of like all the DVDs of every movie that there's a princess in. And I'm sitting there, oh yeah, 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 oh, yeah, David Zippel wrote that one. And you know, yep. oh yeah, Glenn Slater wrote that one. And yeah. And I'm seeing Jack Skellington stuff everywhere. Mm -hmm. Oh good. I like, only just started to notice it. Uh yeah, because yeah, we did um yeah. Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah. Now um, I have a question, which is a, a bit of an emotional question for me to ask. I, I, I ask this of David Sipple. So I hope you don't mind if, if this is inappropriate, please, by all means. Now you, you did do The Little Mermaid when it opened on Broadway and Howard Ashman's, okay, God, I'm already breaking out in goosebumps. Howard Ashman's legacy is surviving still today and will live on forever. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you taking on that job? Uh, and especially this was sort of not exactly early in your career because you had been going for, for 15 or so years by now. So I'm. It was actually earlier in my career than that because oh, uh, I started working with Alan in 98. So I was in my late 20s. Yeah. I had not really, uh, I had never had a show produced at that point. I was working in advertising as my day job yep. and sort of writing songs at night. You know, it, I sort of came to Alan by a roundabout route where I, as we had mentioned, I had worked with Joss Whedon on a project for Disney that was sort of meant to be a, a dead project. It was never going to get made. It was more yep. like a, let's test it out. And afterwards, I was waiting by the phone for Disney to call with my next assignment and they weren't calling. And so I just took it upon myself to cold call Alan Menken's agent and say, hey, like I just did this project for Disney. I don't know if Alan is looking for a lyricist, but I'd be happy to, you know, recommend myself to, which of course he laughed in my face. And then he did some research and by various machinations, I ended up getting to be in a room with Alan. Yeah. Certainly by that point, he had not only the whole Howard Ashman collaboration behind him, but he had several huge hit movies with Steven Schwartz yep. and had worked with Tim Rice. And, you know, I mean, he's, Alan's legendary. Stepping into those Howard Ashman shoes, it's, 
it's a it's obviously a difficult uh, difficult position to step into, particularly when you haven't done anything yet. I had seen The Little Mermaid, the movie, when I was still in college, and it was sort of a revelatory, like, oh my God, this is what a musical can be nowadays. It can be pop music. It could be Calypso. You can write a ballad that doesn't have to be sung like it was in the 1950s. It could be part spoken. It could be, you know, somebody reaching for words and not quite finding them. And that's all, you can do all those things. That was Howard. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I sort of taught myself to do what I do by listening to Howard's stuff and coming to Alan very much wanting to be a continuation of what Howard was doing with him. Apparently, little, little known to me at the time, but apparently I was helped along because personality wise, I'm apparently very similar to, to Howard and mm -hmm. Alan immediately, like I, I, you know, being a nobody who is 20 years younger than Alan, I immediately began bossing him around in the studio and, you know, fussing over every note and fussing over, which is apparently what Howard did. And Howard and Alan loved this. And he was like, okay, I know I'm in good hands because you're doing what Howard used to do and really pushing me and really sort of, mm -hmm. you know, trying to take control of the, of the story. So we, we just clicked very quickly and he gave me a lot of leeway to be the Howard as much as I could. I will never be the Howard, you know, and that's a role that, I mean, I think every composer sort of finds, you know, one true pairing lyric wise, and they never quite get that again, but, you know, being sort of the secondhand substitute is not so bad either. So you carried the torch. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, thank you very much for answering that. I asked David Zippel when I got to the end of the question, I started to cry and then my internet dropped out. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could have been how it tell me, don't ask my friends these questions. They're personal. <laughs> um, but no, I, I really do appreciate it as an artist myself or the people I look up to showing me what's possible is, is how I like to put it. Yeah. You know, what was so special about Howard was, I mean, obviously he was a fantastic lyricist. You know, he was also a director and a dramaturg mm -hmm. and he was so sure of himself as a storyteller that he was able to go to a place like Disney and said to them, you're doing it wrong. Here's how you do it. And they would listen. Yeah. And he, I mean, he literally took that entire animation department, which was falling apart in the late eighties mm -hmm. onto his back and revamped it from the ground up and revitalized an entire, I mean, the entire animation industry basically. Yep. Um, it's, a, it's astonishing. It is. As I've said to people out there, uh, go and watch Waking Sleeping Beauty and the documentary Howard mm -hmm. and get at least two box of tissues for them. Yeah. But anyways, we're going to move on to some happier stuff because as I uh, mentioned in my review, you were the lyricist for today's Chosen Musical, which um, when you had su suggested to me that you know more musicals before the 90s I think it was I'm like well that's brave because I had to talk Andrew Lipper I had to convince him to do his own musical uh -huh. because it, he felt like it would be a bit arrogant like coming on and have his work reviewed in front of him but I had to say like no no this this is a brave thing to do because there is no guarantee of what's going to come out of my co-host's mouth at any given situation <laughs> um you know, and it is a torture chamber. So I, I sort of had to push him into that. And then from that, that set the precedence. So you're the fourth, I think it is, fourth or fifth lyricist or composer that we've booked. And then you said to not do your own musical. And I'm like, whoa, now that's brave because precedence <laughs> has been set. But uh -huh. we are going to do School of Rock by the amazing Andrew Lloyd Webber and Glenn Slater. So before we discuss that, Evan, would you like to run through your thoughts in front of the man who wrote the lyrics, if you're brave enough? Yeah, well, actually bringing up the uh, the David Zippel problem when you went out, your internet dropped out. And I, I made a comment, something about how they busted out, a, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber busted out electric guitar, not knowing anything about Andrew Lloyd Webber's music. Apparently he shreds <laughs> and you didn't tell me. I wasn't no. aware of School of Rock. You're like, no, no, you're not supposed to know about that yet. Jesus Christ, superstar <laughs> either, man. Well, I haven't listened to any of this good. stuff. And Avita, that is electrifying. They all are. Anyways, go yeah. Because sure. yeah, again, all I, I only know, you know, the, the typical uh, pedestrian, but it's a touristy opinion mm -hmm. of I only know, I know of a little bit of Phantom of the Opera and a little bit of Cats. And that's pretty much all I know of Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yeah. No, it turns out he's got rock credentials up the yin yang. Oh, yeah. I ended up actually listening to Variations from 1978. 
album, mm-hmm. just in mm-hmm. my little research roundabout. But yeah, School of Rock. Again, I hadn't seen the film. I was aware of it. I, I think I'd seen bits and pieces. What? I know, I hadn't seen it. What? It's literally <laughs> on TV every four months. <laughs> every four minutes. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, I'd seen bits and pieces of it, but I hadn't actually sat down and watched it before. So yeah, this is the 2015 Broadway production based on the 2003 film. It won, was that a Laurence Olivier Award for Outstanding Achievement in Music? Yeah. Nicely done. So yeah, this high school musical with shades of tenacious D had me filled with glee. The top of Mount Rock had me passing notes in class while you popped a pop quiz for You're in the Band. You're in the Band, of course, being a homage to some of the great songs ever written. Stick it to the man, put me in the naughty corner. Right from the first song was at Top of Mount Rock. I was laughing and going, yes, yes, this is excellent. This is brilliant. The lyrics in Top of Mount Rock, I really hope this was all you. Lines like Odin and Zeus on the bass and the drums and Thor playing tambourine. <laughs> just, just a, what do you mean by all, Glenn? It was all me. It was all. <laughs> As in, not, yeah. not like Googling other people's lyrics. I hope you're not implying <laughs> that, Evan. Thank you very no, much. There's, there's, often, there's often collaboration going on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, and Jesus tossed me a beer. Again, I think three times I heard that and it I pissed myself laughing every time. Top of Mount Rock, you really have to listen to over and over and then read the lyrics of. There's just so much in there. It, mm. it's, uh, it's just excellent. I've, I've absolutely loved that song. There's so many references, you know, lizard skin spandex tights. Um, I think seven inches was stretching it a bit. <laughs> yeah, seven inch bulge. Again, you're laughing constantly. So yeah, that's the opening track. That's that's excellent. <laughs> now, obviously, Teacher's Pet, the final track is, you know, clearly ACDC for those about to rock. You know, that's obvious. What was it? Stick it to the man. I was sitting there going, I, I know this. I know this chord progression. Turned out it's The Shadows, FBI, from 1961. Mm-hmm. Um, took me a bit of tracking down to, to identify it. I hope you're not accusing the great Andrew Lloyd Webber of plagiarism <laughs> on my show. No, no, it's, it's clearly The Shadows. Like, it's, it's not... It's an it's homage not, to is what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's an homage. homage. It clearly is. Oh, you know. the, the, the show, the story is an homage to rock. Exactly. So therefore it's allowed. I was actually hoping that like every song would be a, an homage to something else. Yeah, but there was a fair few. Time to play. Again, I'm sitting there going, I know this. This reminds me of something. Um, turned out it was Sunshine Superman by Donovan, 1966. Yeah. Took me a long time to identify it, but I did find it. You know, I was getting shades of um, Pleasant Valley Sunday by the monkeys from that riff. So mm-hmm. I think there's probably a few that he was influenced by. Yeah. Obviously, it's got to be intentional. I did love, because uh, I did, again, I sat down and watched the film and I've seen, I saw clips of the stage show just to, I needed to see what it looked like. And there's that bit in, I think it's you're in the band where he's handing out homework and he's handing mm-hmm. out CD homework. Now I noticed in the film, you know, the, the keyboardist gets yes, the drummer gets rush, the guitarist gets Hendrix. And in the film, he doesn't give the bass player any homework, but on stage, the bass player gets Les Claypool, which was of course the bass player for Primus who I originally mm-hmm. chose. And yep. I'm, then I'm sitting there going, oh, well, that's not only a coincidence. No wonder he said, oh, I'd do something other than Primus, because you clearly know who Primus are. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I love that. I love that you've you added in bits, you know, that the film didn't have. Teacher's Pet. Just sorry, sorry but before was, you move on, the Live yeah. Aid number, while you're talking about the homages to when they convinced him to come back, those kids and they sing that song that um, about listening. That's so the Live Aid, do they know it's Christmas type group number. Oh, of course. Yeah, I was waiting for you to say that in that that whole time. But anyway, so <laughs> there you go. I didn't pick that one up. Um, well, yeah, Teacher's Pet, funnily enough, again, watching the film, the musical did it so much better than the final song in the film. Like just, I don't know what it was, but I was watching the film going, the, the musical's way better than this. It just, the execution of the song itself. I, don't, I didn't have time to really listen to them side by side, back to back. But yeah, the, the musical was way, it just sounded bigger and badder. Ooh. I'm wondering what happened to Stevie Nicks. Uh, devil Driver drove her off. Because <laughs> according to the Wikipedia, the like Andrew Lloyd Webber bought the rights to the film. And, mm-hmm. you know, in that is the Edge of 17, Stevie Nicks song. Yeah. There's a comment somewhere saying he, it was a shame to waste a Stevie Nicks song. Did, did it end up in the musical at some point? I know she appeared as a guest at, at one point as well. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, the original plan for the show at the very beginning was that Andrew didn't want to write any new music. He just wanted to use the songs from the film. And he asked me to rewrite some of the lyrics so that it would fit in the story. And I sat down with him. I said, Andrew, you're like the father of the rock opera. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah. Like, why are you not writing original music for this? Thank you so much. And there was a lot of hemming and hawing and back and forth. And uh, eventually, you know, you mentioned listening to variations. The director and I sat him down and we played him a bunch of stuff to convince him that he could do it. And one of the things we played for him was uh, Thundercrack by ACDC. Mm. And we said, like, this is basically what you were doing on variations. Like, you Mm. can do this. And it was when he heard the ACDC album that he was like, you're right, I can do it. I'm signing on. Let's write new music. So once we decided to do that, that changed the whole balance of like, what were we taking from the film and what were we not taking? In the final production, we do use a clip of Stevie Nicks, like you're mm-hmm. hearing it on the jukebox, yeah. but we don't have the actors singing it. It's like a, it's like a, like a needle drum. Diegetic music. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay, so for those at home, diegetic music is, in a film TV, you hear music on a radio or, or on a television within the TV you're watching that's it's music that is natural to the scene as opposed to overlaying it anyways <laughs> yeah no no I learned to think that's all good and and apparently they, they I mean we were talking about using some other bits like in the film uh immigrant song is like a big iconic moment but the amount of money that Led Zeppelin wanted for us to use the immigrant <laughs> song was like I mean it cost more than the show itself yeah, because they don't have enough. Yeah. So purchasing the rights of the film doesn't include the music score. Oh, no. It doesn't include the music. Oh, that's yeah. a bummer. No, and that, that's across the board, Evan. That's wow. TV shows as well. A lot of times, like Dawson's Creek is a good example where the theme song for that is different in, in certain countries because of the rights. And then when shows are released on DVD, quite often music is changed because they mm. can't get the rights to that. I think it's bullshit, yeah. personally, because it was created as a piece of art within itself. That song is a part of that art. Complete side note, a prime example of that was uh, Jackass. The first series of Jackass was littered with, because it was on MTV, it was littered with licensed music. Yeah. They released it on DVD. There was like one song mm-hmm. and the rest had to be changed, which changed the scenes. You know, there's some great scenes yeah. in there that, are tied to the music and music isn't on the dvd yeah that was, was really frustrating something recently that they waited forever to put it on dvd because the creator wanted to make sure every song i don't remember what it was like go on deep dives all the time anyways point of the story stevie nicks did end up in the show in in one way or another yeah nice okay yeah because, yeah, I saw mentions of it and it's in the film and I'm like, and I don't hear it on the soundtrack. Yeah, it's like so. it's like 30 seconds of, of the of the original track that you hear. So. Nice. I found it funny, the ones that you did, like, carry straight over from the film, like, in the end of time, the, the mm-hmm. acapella version. <laughs> like, you, yeah. you pretty much use that as is. I don't think you changed it at all. You know, Jack Black and Tenacious D, like, they're so good at this kind of, like, prog rock parody stuff mm. that there, mm. there wasn't much point in us trying to top it. And he was more than happy to let us, I mean, obviously, he got a percentage of royalties or whatever, but he was more than happy for us to port it over into the into the show. And, you know, it's it's so tied to that character, you can't really imagine imagine doing it without it. So, And I think it was also... Because this is something, another thing I go on about is people who emulate the original Broadway performers or whatnot. You could tell that Alex took that part and did create it his own because there were so many beats that he had to hit in terms of, mm-hmm. of that character. And especially in something like You're in the Band, where there is those very dewy, thin moments that are so iconic to the film, but it still doesn't, you don't feel like you're watching or listening to a jack black impersonator because there is only one jack black for a reason and you know he's had the career he's had for a reason and and if alex keeps going on the trajectory he's on there will be only one alex brightman because to be able to take such an iconic character like that because dewey is iconic by now certainly Mm -hmm. um and create your own like that certainly was some pressure on the poor guy yeah i mean He's amazing, Alex. When he came and did our first workshop and he was playing like kid number three or something, you know, like (laughs) he was just hired to sort of fill a role. And he was hilariously funny, just constantly ad-libbing and making jokes. And when we were doing the final casting, they he came and auditioned for for um 
to play Dewey. And, you know, he was like the sort of skinny young guy and he didn't look anything like Jack Black and nobody could really quite picture it. And so we, we sort of turned him away and we weren't finding the, the right person. And a couple of weeks later, we had another session and this guy comes in and looks just like Jack Black and had, you know, kind of roly poly and kind of sloppy and hilariously funny. And it was like, oh my God, it's Alex Bregman. What happened? He gained like 40 pounds to come back and, and audition for the role. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, first of all, that never, like that'll happen in film, but nobody yeah. ever does that for Broadway. No. I, so he came back and was just so committed to it. And again, was hilariously funny. And so in the process of, of rehearsing, we let him, you know, ad lib and we let him sort of play around with stuff and so much of his spontaneous himself of his own sense of humor and his own way of doing things ended up in the show because we all laugh and yeah. every little bit of that brought it a little further away from Jack Black and a little closer to his own creation. And so the, the final vision of it is like, you get where it comes from, you get the Jack yeah. Blackness of it. But it, as you said, it doesn't feel like a carbon copy. It feels like a new a new person who is at home in that persona rather than just an actor kind of going through the paces. Yeah. Um, he, he's the one that he, he ad libbed the Les Claypool, by the way. So you can thank him for that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, I know it's, it, it, it worked perfectly. Uh-huh. The one thing. Yeah. Just the one thing that was missing from the film, they, you threw it in with one of the greatest bass players of all time. Yeah. Right. Yep. Well done. Yeah, now what I've been saying for years is how on earth do I find a husband like Dewey Finn? <laughs> and I was very sad to hear that the drummer, young drummer, died recently. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was yeah. Sorry, you mean the 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 actor who played the drummer in the film? Yeah, the young boy yeah. has, has since passed away. Oh, that sucks. Only just in the past year, I think it was. Oh. Uh, okay, now I have a, a question. I asked this of Amy La Palma, who was uh, in the Australian production, which unfortunately I missed because at the time I was traveling. So I was literally on the ocean when that was in Melbourne. Okay, now, so I asked her this. Did you pick out one of those uber talented children and so I'm going to watch out for that one? He's, oh, she's coming after my job one day because they were <laughs> so incredibly talented. Well, I will say that our guitar player, uh, like astonishing. I mean, he, he came to us when he was like 10 and was i mean just astonishing i don't even i can't even put it into words he would literally sit after rehearsal and just sort of like play solo and shred and people would just be sitting there and watching him for half an hour because he was that good um the girl who played the bass in our production Mm -hmm. in the broadway production she ended up in a band with my son (laughs) and they've and they've been playing out in like clubs in new york so I'm, I'm keeping an eye on her almost by default. Yep. But I, uh, I mean, they're all talented. And I, uh, one of the, one of the girls was in, um, not the movie get out the one about the family. Uh, hereditary. No, 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 no. no. Uh, uh, them, 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 uh, us and them, us and them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they're not related. What? Us, uh, them has got nothing to do with us. Oh, sorry, the other way around. Well, either, I don't they, know. Now I've confused yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone. I shouldn't have said anything <laughs> at all. Yeah, yeah. there's, there's so, Us is um, the film, and then Them was a TV series that had nothing to do with it, had no one even in, remotely involved in it. There was oh, no... I'm thinking of This Is Us. Oh, no. No, one's a horror film. And one's a horrible TV show. <laughs> yeah, it was whichever the Jordan Peele one was, the movie. Yes, she was Jordan Peele. Okay, well, there we go. Yes, because I know Millie Shapiro was in Hereditary, and that's sort of that's the name I went straight to, thinking. Uh-huh. It. But anyways, no, that's yeah. She was yeah. in Matilda, not School of Rock. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, ridiculously talented kids. It's yeah. uh, just crazy, just crazy what they can do. I was just going to say, seeing uh, seeing clips, and I was like, hey, they're actually playing. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're not. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was very um, impressed. Yeah, the girl who played the bass came in and auditioned on like ukulele or something oh, wow. and everybody liked her and they liked her voice and they liked her acting style and they said to her look you know the problem is that we need we need a bass player not a yeah. and she came back to audition three days later and she was like i taught myself how to play the bass and just started <laughs> again wailing away and it was like how is this possible yeah. <laughs> damn talented kids and um maybe you can put this to rest for me is that true that 
the cello, if you turn it on the side, it's practically a double bass. Or is that just a load of crap? Totally not true. Yeah, okay. Total load of crap, so. yeah. <laughs> you have, you have, it sent me on a spiral of... <laughs> so now I know. I think Les Claypool could probably do it, but yeah, no, no one else. Yeah. yeah. But no, in terms of the kids playing themselves, Evan, this is Broadway, mm. not Hollywood, okay? Yeah, yeah. But they could have mimed, you know, would have been easy enough. Hollywood's trickery. Broadway is talented people. They're all-rounders and just amazing kids. But anyways, what are you, you going to give it out of five? Because we'll move on. Oh, geez. Um, again, Andrew Lloyd Webber's rock credentials are just, just dripping off this. Um, Second to none in musical theatre. Yeah, I can see why he's a rock god, you know, yeah. It's vastly changed my opinion of Andrew Lloyd Webber. I'll tell you that. Um, That's because yeah. you're affected by Phantom and Cats and, and you're a straight band. So you hear that and you're like, oh, great, musical theatre. But yeah, it's like it's borderline opera. It's really bored. No, no, this is. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's been rocking out since very way back, probably since he was still at school. Like, you know, listening yeah. to Variations. Variations is just incredible. It's yeah. so complex. And you should totally check out um, Jesus Christ Superstar if you don't know it. It's Yeah, no. Only the title track that everyone knows, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is it is pretty progressive, like mm. straight up rock, amazing stuff. I, I think Tommy might have come out the year before it, but... Mm -hmm. I, other than that, I can't really think of anything that would qualify as a rock opera that precedes it. So, nice. and it is, and it's so much more of an opera in terms of just the storytelling than than Tommy is. Um, so, like, definitely worth checking out. I mean, amazing vocal performances, fantastic guitar work, really, really good stuff. Dude, that's very daring, Glenn, yes. to come on my show and say a bad word about Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> I love Tom. I'm, I'm not knocking Tommy. I mean, Tommy is, but, but Tommy is, Tommy functions more like a song cycle in a lot of ways than an opera. Like there are, there are holes in the story that you can drive a bus through, yeah. which is fine. <laughs> yeah. It's still like, it totally works. We, we discussed it on the show. I've waited yeah. 26 years to see Tommy on stage and I had tickets for August and it got mm -hmm. moved to February. Thank you very much. Yeah. COVID and the assholes um, in Melbourne. I, I had heard that it's coming back to yes. Broadway, actually, Tommy. Yes, now I am. I look forward to not being able to see it being stuck in Australia. But yes, anyway, score, Evan? <laughs> yeah, no, I found an issue with, and I think Aaron has brought this up, with credits. Crediting the singers on or Spotify, the performers. On Spotify, yeah. On, I, yeah, everywhere. It's not just Spotify. It's like if you everywhere. go to buy the album on Amazon, it credits the original Broadway cast or it credits Andrew Lloyd Webber. Like, yeah, and he should. I'm trying to find out who's yeah. singing this song. Mm -hmm. and it's actually quite difficult yeah you go okay that's the cast and that's the cast in that production because obviously there's multiple productions and you get multiple names credited to each song and i'm i'm like i'm just trying to find out who's singing and and often you know not often but you know sometimes the person on stage isn't the person on the original cast recording and i just wanted to confirm the name of the woman who's playing the principal and she's mm -hmm. doing Mo is mozart uh-huh yeah, and I was just trying to pin down her name and I found it really difficult because the credits just aren't crediting the people singing on the album. Sierra Bogus, is that how to pronounce it's, it? It's Sierra Bogus. Bogus, oops, sorry. Bogus. Uh -huh. yeah. Sorry, Sierra, please come on my show. She's phenomenal. Yeah, she's phenomenal. Yeah, I was I was yeah. blown away by her voice just sitting there going, that, that's incredible. Yeah, this is actually the third show I've done with her because she played Christine in the original Love Never Dies in London and she also played Ariel in The Little mermaid on broadway so it's wow. uh i go i go way back with her uh, but yeah she's amazing she's amazing mm. yeah no she would you're really impressive so um yeah I'm, I'm gonna have to go probably a 4.8 i reckon oh, oh. Wow. yeah it's this like you actually expanded on the film like and every everything makes sense you know fleshing out these songs and, and the songs that were just completely original and added in they all fit they make sense you know it could very easily been in the film and, and then some songs were even improved upon. No, this is brilliant. I, I really enjoyed this week because I got to listen to stuff I liked but on both sides. You know, I didn't need to go back to the metal just to get a break from Titanic or something stupid. <laughs> you, you weren't even in the Titanic episode. You listened to that by choice. Stop bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's some times where it's like, oh, I don't want to have to listen to this again. But no, that's why I listened to, a ton of stuff yeah. I, I filled a good 16 hours at work of just 
uh, of just metal and school of rock and then back to metal then back to school of rock and it was quite happy to do it so this is really cool i would hopefully there's a production we can go and see one day has it been to perth yet who knows if we ever open our borders yeah i don't i don't know actually no one's Mm. coming to perth we've we've blocked everybody at the moment yes but it it could have already been um yeah i think school (laughs) is out for summer which is true actually because this episode will be posted right as my nephew is graduating from primary school so there's a child that i raised wow but yes so we're going to chuck to a quick ad break and we're back in a moment with glenn slater G'day listeners, Aaron here. While you're topping up your coffees, did you know that you can support our show and go on a fantastically scary adventure at the same time? Go to www.thetonistontales.com forward slash bookstore to grab your copy of The Toniston Tales, a darkly funny Aussie trilogy about a young boy who rescues injured animals in his spare time and the roller coaster ride he's taken on by a literal fish out of water. Written by me, the village idiot of Thrash and Treasure, you'll come to love Toniston Turnbull and the dozens of wacky characters that he meets along the way. And here is a sneak peek. After barely three hours of light sleep, Toniston Turnbull slowly opens his eyes, his body feeling heavier than it ever has before. Not from extra weight, from tiredness and stress. Polly sighs in the shadows behind him, the flame of the nearest barbed wire tiki torch tower having died down, but not out, while Toniston napped. Are you awake? Toniston whispers. Oh, how can I sleep in this place? Polly moans, turning onto her side and facing Toniston, who stays on his back, imagining obscure animal-esque shapes in the rusted tin roof above them, shadows faintly formed by the nearest dying torches. We need to work out a way to get out of here, Toniston states the obvious. He whispers, despite the fact the nearest shacks to their own are several metres away, and the occupants presumably asleep, as most prisoners seem to be. How? There's no fence to squeeze through, or even climb, Polly replies, sitting up in bed and then stretching out her sore arms. The hairs stand on end from the slight chill in the air. I don't know, but I think the whole fighting thing is a distraction. You mean, to distract the other prisoners when new ones arrive? No, I I think that was just bad timing. Didn't you notice? Toniston goes on to explain his theory. That fight happened, everybody gathered around. I didn't see one person who wasn't watching. And then when I vomited, the only gate in this place closed shut. What are you trying to say? I think something happened when everyone's back was turned. Like what? Whispers Polly, her voice breaking up in fear. I don't know. That's what we've got to find out. Toniston's brain starts working overtime, but it's strange that nobody seems to want to leave. They seem almost happy. Definitely content. So, when's the next one of those stupid beatdowns? Toniston can't help but think Polly looks tough, almost evil in the shadows as she asks, I don't know, Toniston begins, but both teenagers are distracted by a crumbling noise in the distance. Hopping out of bed, Toniston joins Polly on her own, equally uncomfortable one. Spotting a large, white package hovering close to the cave ceiling, behind it a shadowy figure. The package is lowered down, causing the teenagers themselves to lower as well, hoping not to be spotted by whom, or what, may be operating this obscure crane. Over a long, slow descent, the package is dropped to the ground. Polly keeps her eyes on it, but Toniston looks up immediately, spotting a large black shadow scurry away to God only knows where. Come, he whispers, as he quietly hops off her bed, slipping into his docks with bare feet. Polly follows his lead. Careful to keep watch on all directions, the teenagers swiftly sneak over to the white package, their hearts beating an almost tribal jam in perfect harmony, and stopping in their tracks as the sudden realisation of what lies before them sinks in. A woman, seemingly in her early twenties, wrapped up in bandages from the neck down. No, not bandages. Is that spiderweb? Polly asks, completely mortified at the prospect. Grab your copy of The Toniston Tales from thetonistontales.com forward slash bookstore today. Hooroo! All 
Alrighty, listening to Thrash and Treasure. I'm Aaron, that's Evan, and we are joined by Disney icon Glenn Slater. Goodness gracious me. Now, what would be in your dream or ultimate celebrity rider? <laughs> if you could just put any ridiculous thing you want on that thing, what would be on it? Oh, man. I don't think I've ever had a celebrity rider. I don't think I qualify as a celebrity. You're an artist, that's why. <laughs> there, are, there, are artists. there is a difference we talk about on this show there are artists and there are kardashians mm-hmm. and people like that <laughs> again i wouldn't even know how to answer this so i think i'm just going to go with the brown m&ms that everybody goes with yeah i was going to say only green m&ms yeah people yeah, yeah, yeah. see that as something difficult but i i don't know if people realize that that was for a reason that they had a problem with a stage collapsing and so they asked for the brown M&Ms to be picked out because if the owner of the stadium or wherever they were, the theatre or whatnot, was willing to do that, to pay attention to that, then everything else was fine. So I think that is actually a good thing for artists to do because look at how many concerts and festivals and shit that we've had just the other day, sadly, where things tragically go wrong because there are so many people and they're so excited and hyped up and and bands should want their things to be safe. So I was expecting like a goat or something, but. You know, they they bring you the goat and then what would you do with the goat? What do you do with a goat? (laughs) I don't know. What do rock stars do with any of these weird things they demand? I will never know, but I would love to. Uh, Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we can't seem to book any, only Broadway people. So, uh, yes. Okay. Now you were uh, nominated for the Oscar. And uh, now a friend of the show, Jonathan X. So this comes from him. This is not my question. So if you're offended, you can blame him. Uh He's a Hollywood technical director. So this is not being asked in malice, just cheekiness, because he is just (laughs) like me, a punk. Uh Anyway, so when you were preparing for the Oscars, did you practice your losing face just in case? I did not. You did not? Yeah. I did not. However, Alan Menken said to me, if we win, you can give the speech. Yeah. Uh, and so I was very excited for that. And then I got into the car and got all the way to the ceremony and realized I had left my index cards oh no. back at the hotel. And so I spent the entire ceremony desperately trying to remember, okay, if I have to go up there, who do I have to, who do I have to thank? Who can I not forget? What do I need to say? And then we didn't win. And I think the look on my face was not so much disappointment as relief yeah. <laughs> I was not going to go up there and completely go up on my lines yeah he's uh, gonna love that answer that that it was relief I'm gonna start asking every Oscar nominee I know it's a sore spot for some people but you are on a torture chamber artists out they need to remember that so you're gonna <laughs> be asked stupid questions like that okay now so if all your songs you've had so many musicals so far of which tracks of yours would make up a review of your songs? Uh, I think from like Tangled, Mother Knows Best is up there. Vill- great villain song. Always love to write the villain songs. From uh, School of Rock, I would say I uh, probably Stick It to the Man. Um, mm-hmm. Just feels like a really solid beginning to end. Good storytelling. Uh, such a great riff. And you know, I, I really felt like I could lean into that. Uh, I don't know if you guys know the TV show Gallivant, which I think is on Netflix in Australia, but I'm pretty happy with a lot of those songs. So maybe the title song from that. And I did a a Broadway version of Sister Act, which has a couple of good songs in it. Um, I would say maybe uh, Raise Your Voice, which is sort of the big anthemic number from that would go in. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I'm one of those writers who's I, I don't I don't pat myself on the back a lot. I listen to a lot of my catalog and say, oh, I could have done so much better. So <laughs> yeah. it's a it's a hard question for me to answer. But I I mean, there's definitely like a handful of I think the ones I named were ones that I'm pretty proud of. So yeah, awesome. Now, what has been your experience with standing ovations over the years? Have you noticed a change in audiences? You know, I, I think for most of my time, at least on Broadway, pretty much everybody stands for everything. It's, it is the cheapest form of self-congratulation to say I got a standing ovation because it's like, it's like they all need to go to the bathroom and just stand up as soon as the curtain falls. <laughs> um, I will say that I, depending on who I'm with, like if often I have my parents with me at opening nights and inevitably my, you know, the audience will leap to their feet 
and my mother will turn to me and say, are you okay? And you know, it's, I just want to call my therapist immediately. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I don't, I haven't noticed a real change lately. Yeah. I, I think it's a, I think it's sort of like a de rigueur. People just do it now because you're supposed to do it. It's different in other countries, Japan, yeah. they never stand up and you wonder what you did wrong. So yeah, no, that's not, it's not you, Glenn. It's us. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah this culture that because we've had we've asked a lot of people this that um and amy la palma talked about it when doing rock of ages that the producers came to them and said they're not standing what's with this and the cast couldn't give a shit and even mm-hmm. in england they're doing it more so to be polite but i have noticed in in australia that it has been happening a little bit more often and look i'm so i always say i'm not a, a fan i'm a supporter of artists mm-hmm. Right, because I think a fan is a different entity. It makes my eye twitch a little bit, but I am a supporter and I'm here to give you guys a voice. And one of the common things is that it's that questioning of themselves, like, is this for me? Did I actually do that brilliant performance? Or is this just the default now? Mm -hmm. And so it's changed this culture that this was meant to be something that was done when the artist leapt off that cliff and actually soared. They caught hold of that trapeze that they didn't slide off the bars. You know what I mean? And and yeah. It's, it, it's been cheapened. You're, you're right. It, it, I think it has been cheapened. And so I am on a campaign against it, which makes me look like an asshole. <laughs> yeah. In New York, the new gold standard is if you can get a, uh, an ovation, a standing ovation during the show, then that's a special performance. That's an, and I'm telling you, I'm not going moment. That's a mm-hmm. once in a lifetime moment. Yep. That is yep. sit down children. We don't care that your fans of whatever it is your fans of <laughs> goodness me grumpy old curmudgeon um okay now speaking of which what's your biggest beef in this industry what's what's something that not necessarily the main things of you know sexism or racism or whatever it is that society we're always talking about personally yourself what what's something that you think could maybe do without or be changed i i think that there's a a seeminess to a lot of the i want to use the word product being made now <laughs> Um, there's, there's sort of a, you know, you had mentioned like all the theater kids are now leaping to their feet because that's what theater kids do. Mm-hmm. And I think that there, there is sort of a generational theater fan now that has a certain level of expectation of what they want out of the theater. And because they're young and because they're a little bit unformed and because this is like their, you know, their first experiences with theater, what they want is what they already know yeah. to some degree. And so I, and I do think it's been leaking backwards into creators that we've all started working in this sort of default Broadway pop sound, which is, it's fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. The problem is when it, when everything sounds like that, then it stops being sort of a cool flavor and it starts being an oppressive um, metal album. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit like that (laughs) unrelenting bludgeoning of the same sound. Yeah. And, you know, whenever there's a show that has something fresh going on, I, uh, you know, like the, there's a show called Hades Town, which opened here a couple of years ago, yep. which has a kind of New Orleans, Tom Waits, folky, jazzy thing going on. It, it really pops because it is so different. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of wish that there was more space for that and that producers were more willing to take those risks. Yeah, it, it comes down to that. Yeah, what's financially viable at the end of the day, which I mean, musicals and a big part of it is the the music, obviously. And look, I, I complain a lot about sequels and reboots and blah, 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 blah. But that finances the original work at the end of the day because mm-hmm. yep. prove yourself and, and get yeah. budget for an original yeah. work. So it, sadly. I think producers are open to it when somebody does something fresh and it just sort of appears out of nowhere and it's the new sound and it's like, Oh yeah, that's exciting. Let's do that. It's when they have to pre-plan and they're putting together a project. You always end up sort of falling back on what, what they think audiences like. And uh, you know, audiences so far are kind of backing them up on that. So you can't really argue. I know. (laughs) God, it's driving Uh me nuts. Goodness me. And now I'm a lyricist competitive. Are you guys all competitive like actors? You know, yes and no. Um, I think that Broadway is sort of a limited commodity. There are 41 theaters mm-hmm. and 20 of them are filled with 
long running shows at any given time. And of those remaining 20, 10 have plays in them. So any given year, there's only so many things that are going to get on. There are only so many animated films that get made. There are only, so there's always competition for those open slots. In terms of the actual writing, I think not. I think everybody has their own kind of voice and their own niche. Um, I don't do what Lin-Manuel Miranda does. I yeah. couldn't do what he does. I'm wildly impressed by what he does. And so I don't feel competitive in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, like David Zippel is absolutely brilliant at a certain kind of extremely sophisticated, highly rhymed, extremely witty lyric writing, which is like, that's his lane and nobody is getting into that lane with him. So everybody has their thing that they do. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, like we all respect that and sort of, you know, tip our hats and nod our heads and are grateful that they're producing fantastic work in that vein and sort of secure in what we do in our own, in our own lane. Yeah, that was good. At, at, at least it's not cutthroat. Well, as, I hope you, that's what you're, you're getting at, that it's not a cutthroat industry. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's, I don't think it's cutthroat. I mean, it's not, yeah. it's not like all hugs and kisses, but it's not, I don't think it's cutthroat. <laughs> It doesn't need to be. I, look, I don't believe everyone needs to be mm. friends, but and I also don't believe in this that we you should only say positive things about because that's false. You need to be more honesty, and we need to accept people's honesty as well. But anyways, that's me, and this is why I have my friends. <laughs> what to you is star quality? Ah, uh, huh. So I will say that I've. I mean, I've worked with so many, so many actors at this point, and there is a real difference between the people who are stars and the people who aren't. And when mm -hmm. I say stars, I don't mean the ones who are famous. I mean, the ones who are, I mean, they may be incipient stars. They may be stars that nobody has heard of yet, but inevitably they are all smart. They are the ones who are not just doing what you tell them to do and are not just singing the words and are not just a pretty voice. They're the ones who ask a lot of questions. They're the ones who are always sort of pushing and interpreting. They're the ones who put in the hard work to sort of figure out how do I do each note? How do I make each sentence work? How do I pull together a full, you know, a full um, personification of the character through this song? Yep. And you can see them doing that work day after day. Every rehearsal, you see them throwing out the stuff that's not working, adding to the stuff that is working. It's a, it's a process and they're in it for the process. And when they come out the other side, it's like, that's the star. That's a star performance that they're giving. Um, and it just jumps off the stage. You know it immediately. Yeah. Would you ever jump on board with something like Tottenham the Musical? And I'm kind of like, surely there's not a musical about soccer. There's two. Oh, apparently Andrew Lloyd Webber did it 20 <laughs> years ago. God uh -huh. damn it. <laughs> Yeah. Are you dirty about that, Glenn? Yeah. Are you like, damn it, I was 10 years too late. I missed that opportunity. I was totally bummed about that. Yeah. And then I was <laughs> bummed that Bend It Like Beckham happened and like nobody called me. And I was like, oh, damn. And I'm like, like, there's got to be, there's still another one. I'm sure there's still another one to come. So yeah, fingers crossed. But yeah, I would do a Tottenham musical in a second. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know who would go to see it, but I would definitely do it. <laughs> I think the key though is, I mean, do you guys get Ted Lasso over there on Apple Plus on the Apple streaming service? I, yeah, I don't watch TV. Yeah, but we don't, we haven't seen it. I'm, yeah. I'm a quote unquote intellectual. I sit yeah. and stare at the wall. I'm, I'm with you on that. Yep. I, I purely just don't get time to watch stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's a, it's a soccer story that yeah, yep. you don't need to know anything about soccer to follow it. And it's about the personalities and about personal growth and that kind of thing could definitely work. And I think it's just sort of finding those kinds of stories that could, you can make a musical about anything as long as you're finding the human spirit within it and sort of finding a story to tell. I've noticed there is a musical about everything. Yeah. And <laughs> there's a book about everything. There's a song about everything. There's a movie about everything. Stop hating on our art form, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's some subjects that I don't know, maybe shouldn't be sung about. But anyway, well, but isn't that what singing is? It's like catharsis, that release of emotions. Fair enough. Fair enough. But yeah, yeah. turns out there's already a, a, a musical about soccer. Two. <laughs> two. There's two. Two at least. At least two. 
Yeah, because you know there's some awful high school teachers out there that have written their own musicals that mm-hmm. at least one of them right. has to have soccer in it. Oh, that was the other thing in, in my research. School of Rock gets done by schools. Yes. Yeah. Over and over and over. There's all these different YouTube clips and, and you'd swear they were the professional production. And it's like, oh, no, this is such and such a school from you know Canada and this is another school in America. And yeah. It's inspiring so many kids to, to get up there and, and have a go. Um, and some of the productions, uh, again, they look like the actual production. It, it, it's really quite impressive. Yeah. You, know, you see these school versions of things where they've just got cardboard cutouts. But, you know, when we've already got the desks, <laughs> we've already got the instruments, mm-hmm. you know, we've got the uniforms and they, it just works. So it's such a great one for kids to do at school. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say that, you know, Andrew Lloyd Webber was excited to do the show because he is a big proponent of music education in the schools. And he actually, you know, usually when a school does a production, they have to pay like a royalty or a performance fee. He actually waived performance fees for school productions to encourage schools to do it. Um, In England, at least, he donated a lot of money for music lessons for the schools who were doing it so that he could teach the instruments to the kids. I so badly want to get him on my show, Glenn. Sorry, (laughs) I'm not not asking you to pass on any messages, but I'm just so desperate to get him on the show because of what he has done for yeah. this industry, for children, for yeah. all of us. And then the other <laughs> thing he did, I had, I had a, a friend whose school, their, their kid's school was doing it. It was just outside of New York. And mm-hmm. she called me up and she said, you know, my daughter wants to, is a guitar player. She wants to play the guitar playing kid, but it's written for a boy. And, and so I called Andrew and I said, can, is there any way we can specify that these are non-gender specific roles so that any kid who can play any instrument can play any of these roles and just provide an alternate version of like pronouns and whatever, which he was absolutely thrilled to do. So we mm-hmm. made sure that, you know, if there's a girl who can shred, she can play that role. There's a girl who plays drums, go for it, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I would have been the manager because I'm good at bossing people around. Uh, <laughs> now, lastly, uh, can you give us any progress on Bucket of Blood? Uh, I know yeah. you've been writing a musical version of that classic campy horror. Bucket of Blood I've been working on with a composer named Wendy Welf, who's actually doing the, both the music and the lyrics, and I'm just doing the, the script. Yep. And uh, she she also happens to be my wife. Yeah, I was going to so say, but, that, is there any relation? <laughs> I was say that name sounds yeah. familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so Wendy um, started life as both a musical theater writer and a jazz person, and yep. you know is is an, a a fantastic jazz pianist and a fantastic jazz composer. Mm-hmm. And we were looking for something that we could do where she could do both, where she could use her sort of bebop chops and also use her musical theater chops. And we hit on the idea of doing a beatnik musical and looked everywhere for a story that would work. And we finally found this fairly obscure movie by uh, Charles Corman. Roger. Um, which uh, called- Roger Corman. Yeah, uh, Richard Corman, sorry. Roger. Uh, and, Char- Roger and Charles Corman. Griffith. Roger, Roger Corman, Corman. You, you are only, I'm only correcting you because you're writing a musical version <laughs> of his story. So I know, I know. That's the only know. reason I promise that I'm correcting you. Roger Corman and Charles Griffith did the, did the, did the screenplay. And yeah. uh, it's a great sort of horror movie, like a sort of funny satirical yeah. horror movie about beatniks and murder. And uh, she's written a, a really fun sort of bebop jazz vocalese score. And we've done one production of it just before COVID hit or a a year before COVID hit. And we were supposed to be doing another one just as we all went into lockdown. And that has since been canceled. And so we are waiting to figure out when the next production happens, but uh, it will eventually make its way into theaters, hopefully worldwide. It's really funny. The score is really fun and it is, you know, uh, you know, as as we were trying to do for School of Rock and make it feel like real rock and not Broadway substitute, this feels like real bebop, like you would hear in a jazz club, yeah. with imp- like improvisation and you know, it's 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 completely loose and real as opposed to Broadway big band jazz or Broadway pit band jazz. Yeah. So it's uh, it's really fun. Awesome. Yeah. I look forward to that. I do love my campy horror movies, and obviously that's um <laughs> Little Shop of Horrors had started life as a three-day film shoot made on $50 that then got turned into one of the most popular yeah. musicals in the world. As a matter of fact, A Bucket of Blood was filmed the same weekend as Little Shop of Horrors. 
apparently he rented the camera for yeah. like four days and shot both films. I think I was telling Evan about this recently. Was I telling you or was I telling someone else and boring them with these stupid movie trivia that fill my head? Anyways, for those at <laughs> home, he had the set for three more days or whatever. So he whipped up the little shop of horrors. And here we are today with... Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's all all the same sets, yep. same actors for the most part. <laughs> yep, Jonathan Hayes and Jack Nicholson were in it. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Some of the same like background score. And it's also copyright free. Yep. Don't anyone write your own musical version of Little Shop of Horrors. We have <laughs> one. We don't need another one. <laughs> yep. I mean, I, I will say the big challenge for us there the the two movies are similar in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And one of the big challenges was how do we make this not feel at all like little shop of horrors yeah because uh you know a lot of the same plot points and a lot of the same characterization so it took a it took a while but i think we got there eventually awesome i look forward to seeing and if it opens in melbourne i do hope for a ticket to opening night fingers crossed at your invitation like i will say to every guest that comes on the show and no one's going to give me a ticket at the end of the day but that's it i've come to the end of my questions so thank you very very much it has been truly again i keep saying it to every guest it's such an honor to to have you guys on here i've been so incredibly inspired by your work and the work of your colleagues for so long and as an artist, so that it's it's been so incredibly inspiring, and that you guys would give up your name on this trashy show of ours. Uh, well, thank you, thank you for having me. So much fun and really great questions, and definitely the metal adds a, a, a twist to it, which you know, always welcome. <laughs> Is that a, another New York siren I am hearing? That's a New York siren. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I think it's, I've never been to New York. It is always a. A, a sick little pleasure to make you know musical royalty listen to devil music every yeah. week that's, that's always fun that's what? always fun how, how do we get to do this <laughs> what, what the hell this was literally started a year ago on just a whim uh-huh. yeah. just a whim so no it has been an absolute honor now where can people find you on the social medias uh i'm on twitter as yep. slater lyrics yep and i am on instagram as i think also slater lyrics or Glenn Slater lyrics, one of those. So yep. those are the, the two easiest places. But I'm most active on Twitter. That would be the, the place where I'll actually respond. Anyways, that's it from us. Be sure to follow us on the socials at Thrush and Treasure. Comment, like, subscribe, all that jazz. Huge thanks to Glenn Slater for joining us for our 50th birthday episode. It's only 50 episodes, but still, that's pretty good. Uh, anyways... To you at home, you take care, and we shall see you next time. Who wrote? Awesome. Like <laughs> Glexon!